Hey there guys and girls. In this video, we're going to learn about refraction. Um, please pronounce that carefully so that you don't get it confused with defraction with a D. They're kind of similar, but fundamentally kind of different. Um, we're going to use refraction later on to explain how images are formed by lenses. Um, so this is the first step in a couple of steps of understanding what happens in those situations. Refraction refers to the bending of a wave, so again bending, as, it trans as it's transmitted from one medium to another. Refraction occurs when the wave is incident at some angle relative to the normal. So suppose you have something like a piece of glass in air, and you shine light on it at some angle relative to the normal. The light will be bent or refracted at some angle relative to the normal. And so the light doesn't go straight through, it is bent a little bit. We call that bending refraction. First thing we need to understand is those two angles are not the same. For reflection they were, refraction something different. So a good picture may look something like this, um, where you have laser light encountering a piece of glass, and then it is refracted as it enters the glass right here, and then as it leaves the glass, it is refracted again. And so I drew a normal line there, there's the angle of incidence, and there's the angle of refraction. So if you kind of construct a normal line, it's easy to see the angle of incidence is greater than the angle of refraction. Um, that'll be the case when we go from air into glass, but it's not always the case. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is figure out how does refraction occurs, what causes it. The reason that refraction occurs is because that waves pass through different mediums at different velocities. A light wave travels faster in air than it does in glass. So as it slows down, it is bent. So kind of redrawing my picture here, air is a fast medium for light travel. Glass is a slow medium. Remember we learned a couple of days ago the principle of least action. Waves are going to follow the quickest path not the shortest, but the quickest path from point A to B. So if I designate those two points as points A and B, this path is the shortest path, but it's not the quickest path because the light waves travel slower in the glass than they do in the air. If we have something that is even slower, like pudding, the effect will be even more noticeable. So the slower the new medium is, the more bending there's going to be, just because it's gonna, the light wave will go through the quicker medium, the longer path, so we can take the shortest path through the slower medium. So the slower the second medium is, the shorter the path will be in the second medium, which means the smaller the angle relative to the normal will be. Let's draw an analogy to see if we can understand. Suppose that this is a swimming pool and that is you over there. And then for some reason somebody runs by you, takes your lunch, and throws it in the swimming pool. For some reason I imagine you just sitting there eating an entire pizza while you're at the swimming pool. Now you could go this path to get your pizza back, but you're probably more likely to follow this path to get your pizza back. The reason that you're more likely to follow that path is because you're going to move through the pool much slower than you're going to move on the sidewalk. And so if you're going to try to get to something that's in a swimming pool, you're going to take the path that takes you on the outside for the most time to shorten the time that you're actually moving through the pool. Waves kind of do the same thing. And that's what the principle of least action or least time is all about. Okay, so how do we actually compare these angles? Um, the way that we compare them is with using something referred to as Snell's Law. It's a law that relates the angle of incident to the angle of refraction. So again, here's our picture. I'm going to designate the angle of incidence theta 1. I'm going to designate the angle of refraction theta 2. You could switch them, but well, nothing would change. just want to keep them straight. The angle depends on the something called the index of refraction of both media. And the index of refraction is defined as the speed of light in a vacuum, 
which is c, divided by the velocity in that medium, which is v. So we write n equals c over v. c is the speed of light in a vacuum, which is 3 times the new eighth meters per second. That's a constant. v is the speed of light in that particular medium. So in a vacuum, the index of refraction would be 1. For air, it's 1.000277, whatever, which is about 1. For water, it's 1 and a third, essentially. N is always going to be greater than 1, unless you're in a vacuum, in which case it's equal to 1. The speed of light in a vacuum is the fastest possible speed, and so C is always bigger than V, so N is always greater than 1. So knowing that, now we can write something like this. We can relate the angles by saying that the index of refraction times the sine of the angle is constant. And so n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. Again, it doesn't really matter which one is 1 and which one is 2. It works the same either way because the path is reversible. So in other words, light can go this direction and it will follow this path. If you reverse it, let me draw a better line, like this, then it will go out along that same path. And so those arrows are reversible, 1 and 2 is interchangeable. So a quick example. Suppose that we take light and we shine it on glass, and the index of glass is about 1.6. It varies depending on what the glass is made out of. At a 30 degree angle of incident, we want to know what angle it will refract to in the glass. So here's a picture, incident angle of 30 degrees. We know that N2 is greater than N1, 1.6 is greater than 1, and so I know that the incident angle is going to be larger than the refracted angle. So whichever um, index of refraction is bigger is going to have the smaller angle. So I know that the ray is going to bend towards the normal. So I can draw it like that, and then theta 2 would be between the dashed line and the red arrow. So applying Snell's law, I know that the index of refraction in air is about 1, so I can do that. And then solving for theta 2, I divide both sides by n2, and then do the inverse sine of both sides to get theta 2. And so it looks something like that, and you'd get an angle of about 18.2 degrees. So please, um, if you have your calculator handy, um, do that arithmetic real quick. Make sure you know how to use your calculator. Make sure it's in degree mode. Uh, make sure you know how to use the inverse sine function on your calculator. Um, so, you know, do that arithmetic real quick you know, right here and make sure you get something in the neighborhood of 18.2 degrees um, so that we're not making mistakes later. So here's the next question. Um, suppose the light goes all the way through the glass and it emerges on the other side. What's the angle that it actually emerges at? So kind of changing my picture a little bit. Now it's going to look something like this. So since those angles are the same, they're both about 18 degrees, the question is, what is this angle right here? And so if you just kind of look at the geometry of that, um, because n and theta are the same for the red line, n and theta would have to be the same for the blue line. So it would be 30 degrees as it emerges from the piece of glass. So if that glass is square or rectangular, the incoming ray over here and the outgoing ray over here would be parallel to each other, which is kind of what we saw in the first picture at the very beginning. Okay, next thing to discuss is the idea of total internal reflection. As a general rule of thumb, as you take a, um, go from one medium to another, and you increase the angle of incidence, the amount of light that's reflected is going to increase as well, which means you'll have less light transmitted. So remember, in general, both things occur at any given um, interface between two different media. You're going to have some reflection and some transmission. And so, as the angle increases, you get more reflection and less transmission. 
So to kind of illustrate that, here's an air glass interface. The big, bold blue arrow represents a lot of light. At a shallow angle like this one, the most of the light is transmitted, hence the big, thick red arrow. But if we increase the angle of incidence, we're going to increase the amount of reflection and decrease the amount of transmission. So a good example of where you might notice this is if you're on a lake, during the day when the sun is high above your head, like this picture over here, you can kind of see down into the lake. You don't see so much of a reflection. But in the evening, when the sun comes down at an angle like this, you're more likely to see the lake like a mirror. You're going to see the reflection of the trees and stuff around it. Um, and so that's something you can actually notice. Same thing is going to be true if you look at car windows. As you walk through a parking lot, as you approach a car from the back, you're going to see more reflection on the windows. When you look more straight into it, you're going to be able to see into the car better than you did before. Now, in a certain situation, namely when your index of refraction for your second media is less than the index of refraction for the first media, then the incident angle is going to be so large that the refracted angle exceeds 90 degrees. Now, it's not possible for your angle over here to exceed 90 degrees. And so what's going to happen is you're not going to get any transmission at that point. It'll all be reflected. When that occurs, we say that you have total reflection or total internal reflection. Um, it's called internal reflection because typically this happens inside something like a piece of glass or something like that. So let's explore that a little bit more. So here's another glass air interface, but this time the wave of light is starting inside the glass and it's going into the air. So kind of the opposite of our last picture. And so let's say that our incident angle is 60 degrees. So if we apply Snell's law, our N2 would be 1, because air is uh, index refraction of 1. And then solve that for theta 2. We get something like this. And so if you were to punch into your calculator the inverse sine of 1.39, your calculator is probably going to give you an error. If it doesn't, then it's going to give you something that's greater than 90 degrees, maybe, depending on what brand of calculator you have. But more than likely, it's going to give you an error, because that's not possible. It's not possible to have an angle whose sine is 1.39, because the sine of 90 degrees is 1. And so you're not going to have any light reflected, or excuse me, refracted. All your light's going to be reflected. So, we define something called the critical angle, which I'm going to give the symbol theta subscript c. That's the incident angle at which all your light is going to be reflected. And so, no light gets refracted, it's all reflected. The way that we find the critical angle is we set theta 2 equal to 90 degrees. And so, if we apply that, remember that the sine of 90 degrees again is 1 then I can write that the sine of the critical angle is equal to N2 over N1 because this will be 1. And so I can say that the critical angle is the inverse sine of N2 over N1. So for this situation, 1.6 being N1 and 1 being N2, then the critical angle would be 38.7 degrees about 39 degrees, give or take. So if you shine the light at exactly that angle, kind of draw it on my picture here, so here's our incoming light wave like that, then essentially what's going to happen is it's going to simply move like that along the glass air interface. Basically this angle would be 90 degrees in that case. Anything beyond that angle will cause no refraction. All the light will be reflected. And so in a fiber optic um, tube, cable, wire, whatever you want to call it, um, the light is entered in such that the angle is really big, 
And so it just basically reflects back and forth off the edges of the piece of glass, the wire, pipe, whatever you want to call it. And so the light essentially just travels down the glass just like current through a wire. And that's how you can use light to transmit information through fiber optic cables. Um, and hopefully we can see um, some examples of that in class, if we can make it work. Last thing to go over, um, wavelength of light can actually change the index of refraction. There are many materials, glasses being one of them, where the index of refraction decreases just a little bit as you increase the wavelength. And so kind of an example of a table would look something like that. Over in this area with the small wavelengths, we see high indexes of refraction. And then when the wavelength gets bigger, the index of refraction goes down. And not all materials obey that rule, but many materials obey that rule. And so glass is a good example. And so you can take white light, which is a combination of many wavelengths of light, and pass it through a piece of glass and actually separate the light by its wavelengths. You might call such a piece of glass a prism. And a good picture might look something like that. And so you'll notice a couple things on this picture. First of all, you'll notice that the light is separated into colors after it refracts right there. And then you'll also notice over here that at the boundary between the glass and the light, most of the light gets refracted into the glass, but some of it is also reflected. So in general, both things occur at the same time at any given boundary. So that's all we have for today. Till next time, ta-ta.